Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Y Charts. We've been using this this uh, platform for years, and it's always thrilling when they say, "Got something new." This time, they've got this really slick attribution analysis for people that are managing portfolios. So you could very easily see where returns are coming from, where returns are detracting from performance, and much more. So I actually got, we got a question in our inbox this morning saying, how can, asking, how can you tell if you are lucky because the market or a sector is going up or if you're a good stock picker? And that's exactly what return attribution can do for you, right? It can kind of separate those out to see where the sources of returns are. If you're interested in learning more, and if you're a new customer and you want to get 20% off, tell them Animal Spirits sent you and have a great day. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael, I was having some, I don't know if it's nostalgia or just looking back, thinking, I think I've been in the industry for 20 years now. Mm. This is 2024. I entered in 2005. And I think the young kids today have such a leg up on what we had back in the day where, I think it was similar for you and me, where we had no experience in the markets. So we just, we learned through books, like we read a lot and then we started trying stuff. But today you, there's podcasts. Did you and, really try stuff or, or Target Date Fund's really trying stuff? Well, <laughs> that's, but, but I mean, when you're first coming into the industry and you have no practical experience because you haven't invested, you have to learn from the experiences of others somehow, right? Until you can get your own experiences. So for me, that was all these books. And I worshiped at the altar of Buffett and Bogle. And it was the whole thing of buy and hold and long-term investing just made sense to me. I, nothing, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be a good stock picker. I knew that day trading was not in my emotional or psychological makeup. And the whole long-term take the good with the bad, but the good outweighs the bad in the end, that made sense to me. But I had no uh, real-world experience to test that theory. Right? All I'd done is read the books. And I've read about the booms and the busts and the historical returns and all that stuff. And so living through the 2008 crisis when I was really just first starting to invest and be part of the industry was really eye-opening for me of like, whoa, bad stuff. It's really can get really, really, really bad. But then everything after that has been kind of proven right to, okay, you stay the course and you don't get off that course and you'll be fine. So I, I posted a tweet yesterday of all the returns since the 2010s and the 2020s. And I did them by year and then I annualized them. So the 2010s was annualized 13.4% for the S&P. Amazing. By the way, that's not average. That's annualized. So the average, I mean, the average return is even higher than that. Should be, yeah. So the annualized, this is with dividends. For the 2020s so far, if we take 2024, which is up more than 8% already, we're talking 13.6% annualized, <laughs> which is just insane. Because again, you and I have mentioned this. We started talking about expect lower returns back in- 2015. 2015, probably. Some people were doing it earlier than that. So being this like proponent of buy and hold and stay the course, it it's like you see your ideas come to fruition and it's great, but you also know it, it kind of makes me nervous. You know, that's, that's, I know, how, that's exactly how I feel about Bitcoin. You just buy and you hold it. <laughs> but you know that this can't, this simply can't last. Right. Right. And it mm -hmm. can last longer than you think. Like the the 80s and 90s were higher returns than this, and it went even longer than this, right? That was a, a 19 or 20 year period. And so this could keep going on if we get an AI boom, but when you say eventually- it, When you say it, what you're referring to 13% a year compounded. Yeah, like higher than average it's returns. Not gonna, it's not gonna continue indefinitely. It could continue for longer than we think. Yes, but it, it just can't last forever. It's, it, it can't. And that's that's the, the hard part about Why all can't this. It? Why can't it? Because eventually the, things would get too big and you can't com continue to compound at a rate that high if the economy's not growing commensurately with it or it, it's just there's there's limits to these kind of things, right? So, I mean, if you, if you wanted to do like a new paradigm, that 1990s thing, that Dow's 36,000, I guess you could go that route. But you just know historically higher than average returns are eventually followed by lower than average returns. Mm -hmm. You don't know when it's going to happen. And that, that's the hard part about having a buy and hold ethos is you know the, the eventually it's going to be 
you're gonna you're gonna eat shit for a long period of time eventually. Yeah, but now the the counter to that would be, well, listen, you did eat shit for the whole decade of the 2000s. It was a lost decade from 2000 to 2009. That's way in the rearview mirror. It doesn't count anymore. And then I do think one of the reasons that this period has been so great is because that period was so terrible. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that period is so terrible is because the 90s and 80s were so great. Yeah. And so it's this persistent cycle of fear and greed. And I guess I, I'm just saying that like, it's it's great when you you have that, your investment principles, like the mar the market rewarded them. But now you know it, it it really can't last forever. So I guess the the only other explanation is just diversification. That's That's the only answer. Yeah, because while the S and P five hundred has had a, a sick run, uh, a lot of other markets have not. Right. Yes. Even like the small cap stocks have have not done nearly as well. U.S. small cap stocks, obviously international developed stocks, even though they're all time highs finally have not done nearly as well. Emerging markets. I mean, there's there's opportunity outside of the United States. Yes, and that's why even though you you felt like an idiot holding those other opportunities eventually they're going to matter, even if you don't know when or why. But, but the, the, the run that the S&P has been on, it's just been, it's, it's unbelievable. And yeah, don't, I guess don't, don't take better. it for granted. Enjoy it. Yes, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. One of the reasons for these abnormal returns is the abnormal performance of the stocks, the businesses, the size, the margins, um, the relentless bid, which Josh wrote about in 2014. And I wrote, I read an interesting piece last night that, that made me think, uh, from a sub stack, no conflict, no interest. And the post was about how micro strategy is a leveraged Bitcoin vehicle, but there was something in there that I hadn't seen before. And it made me go, Hmm. So he wrote, when you contribute money to your 401k every month, what are you really doing? Are you saving or are you investing? I would contend most people are saving. They have no interest in risking what they already earned, but if they don't, they are starting to lose it to inflation and debasement. If people are saving their wealth in the S&P 500 instead of money, that means the equity market has attained a monetary premium. And I think there is more than a little bit of truth in there. Like that makes we, sense. We, we've traded at a higher than average multiple for the last 25 years. And there's no doubt that the tens of billions of dollars or whatever it is going in every month uh, is impacting the market. It's hard to know exactly how, but you see it every day, right? So I thought the idea that the S&P 500 has a monetary premium, pretty clever. That makes sense. It, that's one of the things that in the past, they just didn't have that almost like backstop. And it doesn't mean stocks can't fall, but the Great Depression right through the 70s, there, there wasn't this. Well, how about this? So we've we've seen, I mean, obviously we've had multiple crashes and bear markets over the last 15 years. So it's not to say that the relentless bid keeps the market higher forever and that pullbacks can't happen because of course we're all human beings. But maybe absent market events, it's having a larger impact, like in calm times than we thought. Bespoke tweeted uh the SP is up like the S&P hasn't had a 2% pullback in, I don't know, 90 days. It's a, it's a ridiculous number. It's up 17 in the last 18 weeks. And I'm honestly struggling to come up with a reason why the market is so strong right now. And it's definitely not just the MAG7. Apple's trading like dog shit. Google's trading like crap. Uh, the rally is broadening out. The, the, number, the number of stocks at a 52-week high. Bespoke tweeted this also this morning. Hit a 52-week high. So things are just levitating. How about this? People... People went into the fetal position for 12 to 18 months there, assuming a recession was coming, and then the recession doesn't come, and it's like, oh, okay, game back on. I know, but it's just, it's 17 of 18 weeks or, or something like that. That hasn't happened <laughs> in 50 years for, for this sort of streak for the S&P, and honestly, what's driving it? I'm, 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 really, I'm really not sure. The, the answers of simply the economy remains strong isn't enough for you? I don't know. This is one of those times where, yes, yes, there are pockets of bubbles and stuff. We're going to talk about that today. And things are getting weird. You had a good post on this yesterday about FOMO. But if you want to make it a fundamental proposition that the economy remains strong, inflation fell. But, but fundamentals aren't driving. I don't think fundamentals are driving the market right now because things are pretty I'm saying quiet. economic fundamentals are making people feel good enough to invest money and buy stocks. Yeah, but there's- Their wages there's, are but up. The, but and I, I get it. But that doesn't explain why the S&P is up 17 in the last 18 weeks. 
That does seem like quite a bit. I mean, <laughs> like, can we just, I don't know, can we go sideways for like a week? I agree. I think we're just in a period now where we we're living in like just mini booms and mini busts. Like who would have guessed that we'd be back at some of this stuff already that we just experienced in 2021. If you think about it, the great depression happened. And then for that wiped out a generation, 35 years, people stopped speculating. They stopped investing. No one wanted anything to do with the stock market. But now, if you think about the dot-com crash happened in the early 2000s, and then we immediately rolled over into a real estate bubble. And then the real estate bubble turned into like this debt cycle thing that blew up. And then the 2010s were pretty timid, even though the stock market went up. But then we go pandemic, boom, to a little bust, and now back had, to- it's just We had a speculative bubble in 2021, and it's the beginning of 2024, and we're doing it again in the same, in the same shit? I think everything is just sped up faster and faster. And this is the, the culture. Now, what was the dopamine culture thing we talked about last week? To, to this, back to the point of this you were saying about is putting your money in your 401k, saving or investing. I do think that looking at it as saving is, is the right way to do it for a lot of people for retirement. But if you have money outside of that 401k, people look at that as investing. And maybe now it's more like speculating as opposed to investing. I think that people that save money in their 401k they don't necessarily think of themselves as, as investors. I think they think that they're saving for retirement. Yes. Right? So yes. I hadn't really thought about it that way. Uh, so it's like it's bifurcated now where it's it's a barbell of saving in the boring stuff and target date funds and index funds and then speculating your face off in the other stuff. That's That seems to be the barbell. I'm, not saying I'm it's a great everyone, example but- of that. So, I mean, I've spoke about what I do a bunch, but I've got my money in my 401k. I've got money uh, every two weeks buying stocks. I've got money going into... Uh, our platform every month, buying stocks. And then I've got a large slug of cash, which I'm very happy to earn 5% on. And I've got a large slug of crypto. Like just completely opposite ends of the risk spectrum. Yeah, that's the barbell, right? Uh, And what if there's just, this is not an example. This is not a, a, a reason for why stocks are doing what they're doing. But is there just so much money out there? I think that's part of it. And, and again, wages have never been this high before. And everyone has a job that wants a job. And I know people hate inflation, but that those wages continuing to rise, that <laughs> what are people going to If you're a young person, we talked about this, and you can't buy a house because it's too expensive, and you have higher wages than you thought you were going to have, maybe you're having some fun with that money and doing something with it. It's an, it's an odd, odd so environment. I want to talk about how the ZERP narrative was completely overdone. And Joe Weisenthal wrote about this. He wrote it better than I could have. At the time of this writing, Bitcoin, is, he wrote this yesterday morning, on Monday morning. Bitcoin is up another 6% in the last 24 hours, 27% over the last week. Shibu Inu is up 180% over the last week. Dog with hat, that's a new one, I guess. Sure, new dog with hat. Yeah, meme absolutely. coin, whose icon is a dog with a hat. Mm. That makes sense. Is up over 400% over the last week. Both Robinhood and Coinbase are near the top of the Apple App Store rankings again. Call option volume at or near its highest levels. He's saying, I think we need to go back and re- and rethink everything about this ZERP phenomenon a few years ago. Uh, so many aspects of speculative excess were chalked up to low rates. You know, here we are, and this is all happening with rates over 5%. Seriously, it's time for some revisionism. I was saying this at the time because we went through the dot-com bubble with 6% interest rates. You can't say that ZERP had no impact, but I don't think it had as big of an impact as some people think. I disagree. I think that you can say that people can have and will speculate when interest rates are not zero. Right? That's a fact. We're seeing that today. We've seen that in history. That's a fact. However, a lot of weird shit happened because of zero interest rates. Just think about all of the Silicon Valley funded companies or all the venture backed companies where the VCs were happy to continue to invest and subsidize the consumer and lose money. Like that was okay. all the ZERP phenomenon. It, it, it just was. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a very good example. But I, I think when it comes to markets, speculation, it often takes another catalyst or trigger to cause that, even if the ZERP helps sit along and provides an accelerant. Because like totally the real right. estate stuff- So maybe maybe the ZERP impacts the economy and capital allocation more than it does speculation. Yes, I think that's fair. Yes, where money goes and, and being pushed on the risk curve. But I don't like this idea that the narrative was overdone because I don't think it was. Okay. I, I just think the whole thing of like the only reason tech stocks were up is because rates were so low. That 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 was the kind of narrative that I wanted to push back on. 
Yeah. Okay. Fair. Uh, well, listen, it's, it's not black or white. There's obviously a lot of gray in there. Uh, Fidelity did a release a report about, uh, I forget what it was called, where people are saving something about retirement. Um, they do an annual update of their 401k plans because they have trillions of dollars in them. All right. So the average account balance in 401ks is 118000 The total savings rate, so this is interesting. They call it savings rate, as they should, but they don't call it the total investing rate. That's true. Um, it's 401k is a saving. It's both a saving and investing vehicle. Uh, so it's gone up since Q4 2018. Uh, it was 13%, 13.7, 13.9, 13.9. So is that average higher than you would have thought? Yes. That's a pretty healthy rate. That's a lot. The average balance for Gen X workers who have been in their 401k plan for 15 years straight topped half a million dollars. Wow. I remember having a conversation with one of my, my brother's squarely in the Gen X phenomenon. He had a birthday this week. I think he turned 45 and it was 2010. And one of his uh, colleagues said, I started my 401k in 1999. It's 2010. I have less money now than I've been putting in. Thinking like, that was the lost decade we talked about. And, but that's the reason that Gen X has half a million dollars average now because they kept putting money in in that crappy decade. Yeah, in hindsight, that was a blessing for them. Didn't yeah, feel like it at had the time. this 15-year bull market. Didn't feel like it at the time. Um, as of Q4, 63% of workers had all of their retirement savings in a target date fund. Among Gen Z workers, the percentage increased to 84%. So they have like a, a, a chart of- Wow, four, way to go, Gen Z. 401k plan design trends. I love the, if you have a retirement research piece, you have a person with a huge smile on their face next to it, <laughs> right? That You just have to have that. So auto enrollment in, at the end of 2018 was 33%. That's up to 39%. Default to target date funds was 90%. That's up to 94%. People are saving their asses off. And the thing is, people want to blame target date funds for pushing up the stock market and stuff. The thing about target date funds, they're well diversified. They own US stocks, international stocks, sometimes REITs, sometimes commodities, or in some cases, international bonds. Uh, so these are widely diversified holdings that people are being put into. Look at this, tar this, look at this chart from Vanguard via the Wall Street Journal. Average retirement plan contribution allocation to target date funds. In 2011, it was 25%. It's almost at 65%. It's gone straight up and wow. this is not plateauing. It's going to continue going higher. Market leader Vanguard with $1.3 trillion in target retirement funds under management as of January says three quarters of large plans it administers automatically enrolls employees with 99% of them defaulting to a balanced investment strategy and 98% choosing a target date fund. So yeah, this number is going to continue to go higher. And that's that's one of the, probably one of the greatest innovations for individual investors in their retirement plan history. This is a great thing. People get automatically rebalanced in a diversified set of funds. Back in the day, people would look at the options. And I'll, I'll buy whatever was up the most over the last three years, or I'm going to put it in a stable value fund. Now they're automatically invested and it happens without even thinking. It's um, kind of amazing. Th this, this is having an impact certainly on individual stocks and as on, on the market as we discussed, even though it's hard to pinpoint exactly what impacts it's having other than you here's know, lifting my, here's stocks my, higher. Here's my question about this though. So if index funds and target date funds are, are having an impact on stocks, why aren't small caps being pushed up more? Because you'd think those would be the ones that would be easier to manipulate and push higher. I'm not, so say, I'm not saying that index, I mean, obviously I'm not, say, I'm not in the camp that index funds are like wildly distorting markets or I'm not in like the broken market theory. Um, so that's a good question. But look at super micro computer, for example. Look what happened when the algos and the traders were front running the S&P 500 inclusion. And look what happened on the on the day yesterday when they finally got added to the S&P 500. I mean, this that is, is kind of crazy that so that that stock went from what Russell 2000 to the S&P. It went from a market cap of I mean, it's it's at it's at it's as big as FedEx right now. Uh, so let's see, super. It's like, it's like going from high school to the NBA because it missed mid caps altogether. Uh, all right, this company had a market cap of six billion a year ago, and it's at sixty billion today. And it went it went parabolic because of AI and chips and all that sort of shit. 
But the most recent blow off top like move was index fund inclusion. How about this? There, there's just no more slow burns anymore of it's going to take the market or investors to figure out this is the next thing. It just happens instantaneously now where if there's a new innovation or something going on, people aren't going to wait around to, to toe in the water to see what happens. It just goes. Markets are happening so much faster these days, and it seems to only be speeding up. Ben, last week you spoke, and I pushed back on this idea that rich people were like, I don't, I don't know if you used the phrase gaslighting or, but- I did. I still don't know if I'm using that term correctly, but okay. it sounded right. Uh, and I pushed back saying, I think, I just think this is like a real online phenomenon. And maybe we were sort of both proven right because a day later we had this horrendous, horrendous tweet from Kyle Bass. Tell the audience for those who are unaware of what we're talking about, what happened. So Kyle Bass is a hedge fund manager and I had, I had an interaction with him in the past and I'm not going to say, tell the story, but he is the stereotypical hedge fund manager you'd think you'd, bad, he, bad hedge fund manager in like a movie or a TV show. That's all I'm going to say. So he wrote this tweet and he's, I think he's a billionaire. I think he became a billionaire from shorting subprime and I'm pretty sure his fund hasn't done anything since. I think he's mm -hmm. still living off of that. I could be wrong. He said, terrible inflation milestone reached. My first $85 breakfast for one at an NYC hotel. After signing this bill, I've decided never again in all caps, hashtag Biden, hashtag inflation. Then he also tagged Janet Yellen and the Federal Reserve. And luckily, the internet was all over this one. He got community noted and people said, so he, he got charged $14 for an orange juice and $26 for a waffle. And I don't even know what heritage bacon is. Is that where like the, the pig gets a massage every night before? And it's, I don't know, it's fed grass-fed beef or something. So his, his bill was $85 for this, this small breakfast. And everyone immediately noted like, okay, first of all, you're a billionaire, so you can't complain. I think that that's just a rule. You cannot complain about inflation or how much you spend ever if you're a billionaire. Ever. It's just It's just a terrible, terrible look. So that's the gaslighting side of things. And a lot of people also noted he's staying at a five-star hotel in New York, which would have been ridiculously expensive regardless of the inflation rate. Right? I, bet it, you, I bet you this meal pre-pandemic was probably still $65. Yeah, easily. It was, a, it was a lot of money. So this is the kind of thing that I am talking about. And I'm guessing the only thing this guy cares about is, can I get my taxes lowered? That's, that's what he's complaining about. And that's, that, that's the kind of stuff I was talking about. So yes, I was, you're right. It's an online thing, but this is the kind of stuff that I was mentioning. I saw another one. Uh, Somebody tweeted, this is a receipt from Burger King in 1986. Three Whoppers, two fries, and two large vanilla ice creams for $8.39. Never forget what they took from us. And <laughs> Jeremy Horpidal uh, did some good actual My favorite Mythbuster. Love it. He said the average hourly wage in 1986 was $7.87, meaning it took slightly more than one hour of labor to buy this meal. The average hourly wage today is $29.66, and you could buy the same meal for $27.19 at my local Burger King, less than one hour of labor. It's good that we have people fact-checking nonsense on the internet. Well, Nick Majuli did a post on this at Dollars and Day today about becoming a millionaire. And if you would have just saved $300 a month from age 22 to 65, you'd be a millionaire. And he, he went back and showed, like, sure, you could go back to the 1980s and say that, but what was the average wage back then? And he said the average wage in, like, 1989 was, like, $23,000. So saving that $300 a month on $23,000 median income was a lot harder to do. And that, yes. So all these things deserve some, con, some I mean, Does anybody want to go, for people that are, that are tweeting, like, does anybody want to go backwards? Would anybody choose to go backwards? I, they did used to have the crowns at Burger King, though. Remember that? That's Remember true. the crowns. Uh, and they had ball pits Duncan, in the Duncan, insert crowns here. Anyway, nobody, nobody wants to go backwards. No. I, the, is, the, the funny thing is, I was watching... What movie was it? Oh, Wanderlust was on HBO the other day. That's the Which one is Paul that? Rudd, Jennifer Aniston one where they go to like a hippie commune. They buy a, they buy a, it was like a 2010 or 2011 movie. And it was funny to see because the recession stuff was still right there. Like the great recession. It was like they bought a condo. It fell in value. They were forced to sell because they lost their jobs. And then they went on a hippie commune with Justin Thoreau. It's an okay movie. But I, people, I've, been, I've seen people tweeting about like, it was so much easier to go out in 2010 because things were cheaper. The funny thing is, because of the way this cycle works, someone's going to be, in 10 years, someone's going to look back and say, remember how great things were in 2023 and 2024? That's what's going to happen. Because people just, they, they're either younger or they forget and they become nostalgic for periods of time that they don't really 
think about. Yeah. So that, that's going to happen. Yeah. These are the kind of things that happen. All right. Uh, from Tal Smith at New York Times, auto insurance. Motor vehicle insurance rose 1.4% on a monthly basis in January alone, has risen 20.6% over the past year, the largest jump since 1976. Saying that this is like one of the big, bigger pieces of inflation right now. Have you, with your insurance broker, have you upped any of these lately? It's absurd. I, I, uh, I got my renewal recently and I said to him, hey, I don't even drive. Like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, uh, my car is... Yeah, but you do drive with a death rattle, so... That's true. But I have like 6,000 miles on my car, maybe. And I think I've had it for close to two years or a year and a half. That's right. You drive... The train station is, what, a mile away from you? I don't even drive to the train station. I walk. Because the babysitter needs it for after school. So, anyway. So, I said, hey, can I... This seems like a lot of money I'm paying insurance. Like, I don't... I I don't drive. He's like, that. no. It's not mine, tr- when I re-upped mine last year, it tripled. And... I've been with the same, I was with Progressive for like, since I've had my own car. So it's been, I don't know, 20 some years. And, and, I, and I do my home with them. And so it's all bundled together and you get a discount or whatever. And it tripled. And I'm like, I call them like, well, what happened here? And they're like, I don't know. Cars are more expensive. Like we can't really explain it. I, I wonder, got a little bit of a cheaper deal somewhere else. But I wonder if you get a minivan, do, do rates go down? If like, like, all right, this person's uh, clearly... Uh, Driving this <laughs> under the speed limit, we're gonna we're gonna take it easy on them. I, I mean, it has to just be that cars are more expensive, but the jump doesn't seem commensurate with the car. Values you might not either. know this about me. How do you what what sort of what do you think I drive in terms of speed on the highway? Am I am I do I do the speed limit? Am I closer to seventy five miles an hour? What do you think? I would have said you're like seven miles over. Wrong. I'm not a fast driver. You're a slow guy, really. I. Uh, I'm like 65. I think I think, so I'm, the, I think I'm sort of wait, average. When it's when what's the speed limit? I don't know, 60. I, I I usually I'm usually below. Although maybe this has to do with my Jeep. Maybe if I was in a faster vehicle or more comfy ride, I would go faster. Well, that's right. You can't. You, maybe you can't go above it because you're like the opposite of speed. Like in speed, you can't go below 55 or the bus will blow up. You're the opposite. If you go above 55, your Jeep will blow up. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I'm like uh, 62 or so. Okay. See, I, I'm I, I push it. I go like so if. In Michigan, the highways are 70. 75 in some areas, actually, too. I'll go, give me a nine on there. I'll go 79 and a 70. I do think you can learn a lot about people by the way that they drive. Like, you ever well, been you, a, you've, you've yeah. heard the George Carlin one, right? Mm-mm. Everyone who drives faster oh, than you is a maniac, and yeah. everyone who drives slower than you is an idiot. But you ever see, you ever been in a car with somebody who, who, where it's your first time in the car with them, and they're just a really aggressive, get out of the way, asshole, like where they're <laughs> like that? Uh, my whole contention has always been, Easily 75% of the people on the road are bad drivers. Yeah, I agree with that. And that might be low. You know, I'm a, very, a lot of I'm, good a very, out there. I'm a very selfless driver. I'll give you an example. You let people in? I'll give you, no, I'll give you an example. So driving down my road onto the main road called Merrick Road, um, if somebody is either going straight over Merrick Road or they're making a left, most people don't move over enough so that if somebody wants to make a right, they could just go around them. Not me. I pull over to make sure that if there's somebody behind me, they could sneak by. Not to brag, I'm a very, very conscientious driver. All right, but you want to get the wave. I get mad if people don't get the wave. I'm happy to let someone in. That drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. My other really big pet peeve is people who, on the highway, pass you, get in front of you, then slow down. Like, they don't know how to use their cruise control. I think there should be a horn specifically for saying... Why aren't you using your cruise control? It just shouts it. Those are the worst. You pass, then they pass, right? Because you have your cruise on and they don't. Easily, Those are the, the, worst. Not, the not wave is the worst person in the world. Uh, and a distant second. I don't like when you're going to, you're pulling up to a red light and somebody speeds in front of you and just literally cuts you. Yes, that's like, bad. Come on, really? You, where are you going? I agree. All right. You asked why things continue to be so well in the stock market. Maybe it's because. People with the most money who have the most stocks are still flush. This is from Torsten Slock, who is becoming our, uh, a regular on Animal Spirits for the past six months or so because the charts are so good. The highest income quintile, so the top 25% by income, consume almost 40% of uh, spending. So the consumer spending is 40% is done by the top 25%. Sorry, the top 20%. And the top 40% makes up close to more than 60%. 
So the people with the most income spend the most money, but it's not commensurate with their level. It's it's way more. I still don't think that there's a direct link between this chart and the stock market today. Okay. So you're you're at a loss for words for why the stock market continues to be so strong. Is it 17 of 18 weeks? That's the number I keep using. I, f I don't know if I'm making that up, but it's something like it, that. You said it so confidently. I, I agree with you, but I, I, I don't look at like weekly returns. So why is that dynamic persisting? That's my, that's my question. And that, that's not an economic thing. That's a, that's a market thing. I think the trends are shorter, but more potent, right? Like that, this is why I think the, the- Remember potent potables? Oh yeah. <laughs> Was but that the, Will the, I'm surprised that we haven't had more flash crashes. Why? That, 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 because of the way that the mini booms and busts and we have these citadels of the world controlling the liquidity, I'm really shocked that we haven't had more of these rug pulls where we have a, an air pocket. I mean, think about how, how many huge down days there were in the pandemic in that March 2020 period where we lost 8, 9, 10% or whatever. I, I think that's just, the, I think the market's just- But there's been, the, there's been no news to knock us off this trend. That's what I'm saying. So if it's going to trend, it, the, the trend, instead of being really slow stair step, it just happens a little quicker now. And we just, we pull everything forward, the losses and the gains. All right. Uh, I pulled this one from the transcript. Just wanted to talk about the consumer again, remaining strong. They did this whole thing where they pulled consumer quotes from recent earnings calls. This, they did MasterCard, Wells Fargo, and American Express. This is MasterCard president. Consumer remains resilient and consumer spending remains robust. I would venture to guess robust is used on 30% of all quarterly calls. We'll have to check on quarter for this, but it's got to be a lot of them. Let's see. Here's the next one. I feel this. We say the same thing over and over again, the last number of quarters, but the consumer continues to be very resilient through a time when I think we all would have thought there would have been more weakness at this point than American Express. Consumers are doing what they do best, which is consume. And more importantly, all the credit numbers and balance sheet side of consumers is very strong. Just in, I, I went down this, this list from the transcript and every single one of the earnings calls was like this. It was like, we, we would have thought consumers would have been weak right now. They just continue to spend and they're not stopping. We love to spend money. I just can't imagine ever betting against the U.S. consumer. Was there a monster change in consumption post pandemic? Just like people's habits about spending money? Yes. I think that's, there's going to be a line in the sand there. It was the opposite of the great depression. We had these frugal misers in the great depression with like the depression babies or whatever. So now we have consumption babies from the pandemic or something where everyone just decided like, screw it, I'm going to live my life and spend. I think we, I think we do. People are only talking about the inflationary side of prices being up. No one is talking about the fact that wages are way higher too. I don't think anyone thinks that way that, oh, wait a minute, wages went up too with the prices. So people are spending more. I don't think people are making that linkage. Hmm. All right, I know you hate demographics, so you can stop listening for a while if you want. I don't but I think hate this demographics. <laughs> I just don't think it's... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> this is the New York Times. In 2022, America had 4.75 million 32-year-olds and 4.74 million 31-year-olds, the largest two ages by population. So look at the largest ages by population. I knew I kept running into 31-year-olds. They're everywhere, They're like locusts. <laughs> it's basically all in your... It, it was kind of a, an interesting way to look. I mean, this is like niching down on the demographic thing, but it's just saying the majority of the age groups are now in their like mid to late 30s and 40s. And you have to think about the consumption patterns of those people. What happens when you settle down and buy a house or get a new apartment or move to the suburbs? You spend a lot more money. And this is going to take a while to play out still too. From The Guardian, those born between 1981 and 2000 are in line for a seismic windfall over the next 20 years. According to Knight Frank, they did this study saying $70 trillion of assets is going to move hands between the generations in the U.S. alone. I, I still think this is overstated because I think the boomers are going to spend a lot of it down, especially if they're retiring early and living longer. But basically just saying millennials Not are going to The market keeps going up 13% a year. Well, true. And here's one more demographic. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think this is overstated. I think there will be massive ramifications with respect to the wealth transfer. I don't have any strong predictions in terms of what that's going to look like. Um, but I think it's going to happen a lot it's going to be a lot slower than people think. Here's an, here's a, here's an obvious one. Uh, more preference for digital assets. Right? The, yeah. aver the average 60-year-old is going to have, if I don't know, 0% of the portfolio in, in Bitcoin. 
right? Rounds down to zero. Yeah. The fair. average 35 year old will invest differently. They just will. I also, th I, I also think this, we, we always talk about how all these financial advisors are hanging on for way too long. They promised they'd send their book of business down to the younger person, but they didn't. That's going to be the change when all the boomers start retiring and passing down their money or they die off. Then a lot of those older advisors too are going to lose business because young people will find their own advisors. Mm. I can think of that too. All right. Another one from St. Louis Fed. Those born in the 90s, younger millennials and older Gen Zers had an even sharper swing in wealth deviation from expectations between 2019 and 2022. We've talked about this, how young people are doing better than we thought, but the St. Louis Fed looked at what if they were on trend from before? How would it have looked? And they're saying that this group's wealth surged 44% from 44% below expectations in 2019 to 39% above expectations in 2022, an 83% swing. Basically saying that like this change in wealth in this three-year period was unlike anything we've ever seen and will ever see again, probably. And the biggest one is home ownership and then financial assets were part of it too. But they're saying that we've never seen a swing like this go from such below expectations to above expectations in such a short period of time. They're way above the levels of wealth we would expect of them to be based on historical trends and based on like where people were in the past at their age. Really? People, yeah. are, people are flush. Yeah, they are. There's just... We have a chart later in the show about the the value of real estate. There's just so much money. And we're not going to get a crash in asset prices for no reason. Right? Like, right. it's not just going to all of a sudden there's going to be, there has to be, there, and I'm not saying that they, there won't, I'm not saying that we can't have a pullback or whatever. It's not going to happen for no reason. That's the thing. Absent an event, the trend will continue. Right. What's the catalyst going? There can be corrections. There can be bear markets we had in 2022. But if you want like a system-wide crash, there has to be a something there, you're right, that is going to cause people to panic sell these assets that are up in value so much. All right, Ben, one month, this is from Fast Company, one month after taking its open AI-powered virtual assistant global, the Swedish buy now, pay later company has released new data touting its ability to handle customer communications, make shoppers happier, and even drive better financial results. This is Klarna. Uh, the app-based AI chatbot already handles two-thirds of all customer service chats. Uh, Klarna boasted in its announcement on Tuesday that the AI assistant is doing the equivalent work of 700 full-time agents. You know, I need an AI assistant. Ben, listen to this. I don't know if I told you this. I got an alert on Friday. It's time to check in um, for your flight. I'm like, wait, where am I going? Did I forget that I've traveled? I booked my Denver flight, which I'm the actual date is March 24th. I booked it for March 3rd. Okay. Not even close. Not even close. Here's what did you do? What did I do? I, well, I switched my flight. Okay. Uh, on Thursday, Josh, Matt, and I had a meeting, scheduled a meeting for Friday at 3 o'clock. So the next day at 3 o'clock. I sent out a calendar invite. And then the next morning at like uh, 11, Josh sends out a calendar invite. I'm like, what, my, my invite's no good? Like, <laughs> are you saying you had a better invite than I am? His invite trumped your invite. Well, turns out it did. Because on All Saturday, right. on Saturday, Matt declined the calendar invite. And I realized when I got the email notification that the invite that I sent was for March 29th. The actual meeting was for like March 2nd. So I, am a, I need an AI assistant. I am, I am a complete disaster. So here's what I want to see if AI can fix. We went out to eat the other day and we go to the front and they say it's a 20 to 30 minute wait. Okay, fine. We'll go walk around the mall, which talk about consumers being flushed. This is on a Saturday. My, my kids wanted to go to Cheesecake Factory. We go to Cheesecake Factory, which, you know, I'm not a big, I, I hate going to the mall, but my, that's like my kid's favorite restaurant. And there's an hour and a half wait at Cheesecake Factory, like 4.30 on a Saturday. And so we go to On the Border. This is, this is uh, this, the stuff kids like these days. There's a 20 to 30 minute wait. We wait, walk there was out a wait at 4.30? Yeah, at 4.30, hour and a half. But we, so they tell us 20 to 30 minutes and on the border. See, I only eat at fine, fine uh, dining establishments, as you can tell. Whatever, the kids don't care. And we, so we go walk around the mall and five minutes later, oh, your table's ready. I feel like the people at the hostess stand never know, they, the, the, it can be plus or minus a half hour. They never actually know how long it's going to take for your table to be ready. I feel like they just make up the numbers. An hour. Yeah. So where does AI fit in? Couldn't it better estimate 
people's eating times based on what they order, how long it's going to take in the kitchen. Yeah. I want a more, I want a more precise figure from AI. When I, so when I was, uh, when I called Delta to rebook my flight, I'm yelling at the phone like Larry David. <laughs> By the way. That was another good one this week. Richard. Him, Larry David yelling is some of the funniest stuff on television. I don't know if it's because he passed Russ in Peace, Richard Lewis, but he really looked like death in the most recent episode. Did you notice that? Yeah, my wife and I both mentioned it. I, I was watching some old clips of his too. He was. He looked really, he really great. frail. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm yeah. yelling at Delta. The customer service AI is has to, like Clarn, like Clarn is talking about. That's going to change things. My um, speaking of, there's not really AI, but just in terms of like, yes, prices are higher. We're talking a lot of inflation. There's so much consumption, but then there's like the push and pull of de- the technology deflationary wave. My dad is taking. My dad's retired. My dad is taking piano lessons. The whole package cost him thirty five dollars. Like an online lesson. Yeah. So someone gets on Zoom with him? I don't think it's, I think it's like pre-recorded. Okay. $35? Wow. Something like that. Isn't that wild? Yeah. That seems really cheap. Um, all right, Ben, are you ready for my Vision Pro review? Let's hear it. I've seen pictures of it. This might surprise you. I'm going to start with the bad, and then I'll go, with, go to the good. Okay. Wait, can you put it on while you're giving me a review? I can't, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, there's, there's not much going on there in terms of what you can do. The only apps that exist for me were are Safari, Disney Plus, and Max. Right, because there's not a lot, all the, a lot of the places are still, t- like Netflix doesn't know if they want to get in there, all that. Right, like right. there's no Slack. So in terms of like being able to do work on it, I couldn't connect it to my laptop. Like it's just, it's also very clunky. So everything sinks to your eyeballs. And you've got to like pinch things and you've got to sink your, your finger to your eye. And it's just, it takes a bit, a little bit of getting used to. Um, I guess maybe it's sort of like how when we first got the iPhone, it was like hard to type, right? People were like complaining about like the, so we'll, yep. we'll, we'll get there. Um, all right. It's big and heavy. Okay. So work out. after like an hour or so, maybe not even, it hurts my nose. Like the bridge of my nose was sore the next day. Like I really, I really felt it. So the, the travel case is also big. Like there's a handle for the travel case. So you can't just like put it in your backpack unless you have an oversized backpack. Okay. Um, it's, you're, you're right about this part. This is not going to surprise you. It really is incredibly isolating. Incredibly isolating. Um, having, having it on when there's people around you is, Definitely not cool. Like if your wife's around, if your kids are around, um, it's also really loud. Like the sound quality is great. So Robin got mad at me because I'm, I'm in my office on my chair watching something and she's like sc- screaming. She's like, you didn't hear me? I'm like, no, I didn't hear you. Wait, what do you have? So it, it comes with, do you have AirPods in or what do you have? No, in for your- so there's, there's speaker somehow in oh, there. Okay. The sound quality is, is, is stupendous. It's okay. really good for what it is. Um, and it's stupid expensive. I it, it, It's like $4,000. Okay. All right, so that's the bad. Here's the good. It really is magic. And it's hard to describe in words, but it 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 works really well. Okay. The, right, like the, the screens and all that stuff. It's, but- it's magic. There's something called an immersive experience that, that you could watch on Apple TV. So one example is you could be in the studio with Alicia Keys and I almost like got emotional because I was so like moved by like the magic of this thing. I was like, this is fucking insane. I felt like okay. a four-year-old walking into Disney. Uh, the movies. Holy shit. Holy shit. How do you watch them? Through Apple TV? Through Apple TV or Disney Plus. So okay. in terms of like the immersive experience at Disney, you could choose the setting in the background. You could be on top of the Stark Tower. And you look around and there's like a giant Iron Man suit behind you. And it's all, it's all around you. It's like, it's like having this sphere on your face. And then if you want to watch a movie, which you can watch movies in 3D too. Uh, what well, if you press play, Manhattan turns to night. So the lights go down. There's also a cinema feature where if you hit the cinema button, you're at the movies. It's a giant screen theater. You could sit in the balcony. You could sit in the front row, the middle, the back. So they just have to figure out a way to do this. 
without having a goggles on your face. Yeah. So I watched. Then, then I'll do it. I watched Napoleon on my face, and it was, it was like just a surreal experience. Uh, so this is definitely the future for sure, but it has to get smaller. It has to get lighter. And I'm sure it will. And it has to get cheaper, and it will. So there's, oh, also, they show you a clip of being at Fenway on first base and being at the soccer stadium. You're, what I said about being at concerts and movies and sports, you're, that's, going to be, that's going to happen. Right. You're going to be watching a baseball game like through the view of the umpires. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, all right. So there's an 85% chance, maybe 90, that I'm going to buy one in the future. But I returned mine. Okay, they took it back. They took it back. You just thought you wouldn't use it enough yet, probably. There's two reasons why I returned it. Uh, number one, like I said, it just, it's not comfortable. Like it just, it, it did hurt my face a little bit. And number two, th- I used it. This is a very good opportunity to teach Kobe a lesson. By the way, so Kobe picked up on it in two seconds. He just turned seven years old. He picked up on it in two seconds. How do you use it? He was calling it an eye mask. And I'm like, this kid's brilliant. <laughs> Because I thought he, I thought he knew about like the iPhone, the iPod. Yeah, he was calling it an eye mask because it, it's a mask that goes over your eyes. Okay. So he said to Robin, "I don't know if I told this story a couple of weeks ago, but when we were in Fort Lauderdale, we went into the elevator, and a guy was like, hey, Mike, I'm a big fan,' and it was a proud dad moment for me. But when we left, Kobe said, "Are you famous? Because he sees me on TV on on YouTube." Like when he goes to the YouTube, he sees he sees my face. Yeah. So he thinks I'm on he thinks I'm on TV. He saw a, a fan interact with me, and he said to Robin, "Is Daddy rich and famous because he bought the eye mask?" <laughs> oh, interesting. And I'm like, "All right, that's it. It's going back." Right, I can't. A good lesson. It's a great lesson. I and I can't have Kobe thinking that I'm rich and famous, which is not true. But I so I returned it and I explained to him that. It was too much money and we have to spend, we can't spend money on everything. It's not unlimited. We have to save the money for other things. And he was mildly disappointed, but I think he got the lesson. So I was very okay. proud of myself. I like it as a lesson. So get their hopes up and crush their dreams. Exactly. So if he didn't say that, I, I don't know if I would have kept it. I was, I was 50, 50, but as soon as Robin told me that, that's it. It's going back. back Duncan to put out a poll on the compound YouTube and only 26% thought you would return it for a refund. So the majority was wrong. Uh, but they were wrong for the right reasons. Like I, 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 if Kobe didn't say that, I probably would have kept it. Right. So uh, like you see in some of the futuristic movies, like her, it's like a hologram you hit and it, the screen takes up your whole room. That's what, what, if they can make, dude, that that happened. Yeah. I'm watching, I'm on my, my chair back there and the, the, the screen is the size of my room. Right. It's insane. And hopefully they'll, I'm sure they'll be able to do that stuff eventually. It's hard to to verbally explain it, but once you put it on your face, you're like, oh, there's that, that's it. There's no going You back. sent me a video of Chris using it, and you just look so weird doing it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Because mouth is open, and you're doing But yes, okay. Oh, look at that. Bitcoin, all-time highs. Okay, so let's get into crypto. Uh, I'll take... Oh, people last week said I didn't take a big enough L. I said like four times. I took the L I was First of all, I, I, I wasn't trying to give you the L. Like oh. no, you I, got, I was. I'll admit it. I, I said no, 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 I was no, no, underwhelmed no. by the crypto. Your ETF reaction was on. Your reaction was understandably defensive. I wasn't even talking about your prediction. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I keep saying, why isn't coin? Why isn't this impacting Coinbase more? Uh, Brian Armstrong, we are dealing with large surge of traffic. Apologies for any issues. The team is working on remedies. Look at Coinbase and MicroStrategy. They were both down ninety percent at the lows. MicroStrategy is all the way back to all time highs, and it just rocketed higher. Coinbase is still thirty some percent below all time highs, but that's you know they they do the charts with. This level of gain requires this, or this level of loss requires this level of gain. Those are huge gains to come off of those kind of lows and be even near all-time highs or back, or back at is kind of insane. I before, mean, the thing we- before we, we keep, before we talk about the flows, can I just, I just want to share with the audience a conversation that we had in terms of like, where do we trim some, right? Because, this is a conversation you and I have been having. Like, yeah. we have to take some off the table eventually. So- I've been bullish on Bitcoin for the reason it's incredibly simple. For me, it's just been a demand supply imbalance. I that, still can't believe that you missed that one. You were going to put on the perfect trade two weeks ago. It well, was, I, 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 I did buy it at 38,000, but I only put five grand in. Okay. Um, but you were willing, dip, you were willing to make a big buy at like 42,000. 42,000. Sorry, that, I didn't, yeah, didn't mean to rub it in. Didn't mean to rub it in. That stinks a little bit. But anyhow, 
So I, I did have conviction that it was going a lot higher, um, but it's happened very quickly. And so it's become a much bigger piece of my liquid net worth than it probably should be, frankly. For and we me, talked about this, the last boom, we said, I think we said 75,000. We'll think about selling. We probably wouldn't have. We would have said, okay, let's go to 100. Yeah. But we talked about like in such a volatile asset that's going to crash a lot, the rebalancing piece is probably not a bad strategy. You just have to figure out what your bands are. For me personally, and this is definitely not financial advice, with Bitcoin specifically, I think most, most investors, in terms of thinking about regret minimization, you'd rather sell early, right? Like if you leave some on the table, big deal. But if you give 30% back, you're going to feel like an asshole. For yep. me with this, it's the opposite. I'm okay holding on too long. I don't want to sell early because I think it, I think with this asset is so insane and the moves are so dumb. I didn't sit through a 77% crash in Bitcoin and an 80% <laughs> crash True. in Ether just to sell back when it got to an all-time high. So that's how I'm personally, I personally will have, I keep saying personally, <laughs> I will have more regret if I sell early than late. So that's how I'm thinking about it. That's Everybody fair. has to do obviously what's right for them. My thinking has always been with Bitcoin is that it's a call option and I'm buying and holding it forever, forever in quotes. But basically that was my strategy is I'm just never going to sell. And it has been very painful at times, but I think just knowing that has made me okay with dealing with the volatility of it. But I'm, I'm starting to think as you are, like I should think about rebalancing at some point when it really runs up and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out a level for that. And I think it's getting close. Yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, so just back to the flows. So Baltrunas tweeted yesterday, Fidelity strong with plus $400 million today. It's biggest one day haul. Bitwise had third best day. Anything I bit brings is just padding the net number. Throw in the rally and the 10 will likely hit $50 billion in AUM tomorrow. More than halfway to passing gold ETFs less than two months in. Now, that's kind of crazy. The crazy. gold ETF, halfway to gold ETF. That's I think 27 of that is, is GBTC. But even netting okay. that out, even netting that out, these things have taken in yeah. over $20 billion. But that, that money is still in a Bitcoin product. Uh, yeah, that's... So when we actually talk your book on Monday, we'll... Is it the following Monday? Yeah. One of these Mondays with uh, Fidelity Digital Assets. About. Anyway, what I would implore listeners who are thinking about buying it or feel FOMO, because there's stupid shit happening. Like, we're we're back. Um, yeah. We're not at 2021 levels yet, but it's there's stuff. Well, but there's not, a, there's not a ton of coverage. I was looking yesterday. If this was 2020 to 2021, it would have been the front front page of every financial publication. It, CNBC, does, feel like, it CNBC, does feel like retail is not like back all in again or something. I think because the memories of the last crash are still very, very fresh. Uh, CNBC had one little box up there. New York Times had nothing. Wall Street Journal had one little thing. Like it's not plastered everywhere. Um, right. So a CryptoPunk sold for $16 million. It's right. just the, the meme coins that are up 300% in a week. Like FOMO is natural. And I wrote an article about this yesterday. Just be careful. If you want to speculate and have fun, just a thousand bucks, whatever your number is, like just don't, don't go nuts, please. Um, this this made me laugh. Corey had an interaction with Cliff. Corey tweeted, "This monk or monkey? I think it's I'm okay. I don't know what this is. Just sold for five hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. This penguin just sold for five hundred thirty-one thousand dollars. This punk just sold for sixteen million dollars. Crypto animal spirits are back." Cliff said, Corey, where do you see these transactions? I'm blissfully ignorant of how to monitor the monk stuff. And Corey said, there's a deep cost to your sanity and psychological health that comes along with monitoring these sorts of things. Are you sure you really want to look deep into that abyss? To which Cliff replied, <laughs> you're right. Please don't tell me, even if I ask again, you're a true friend. Sometimes you stare at the NFT and sometimes it stares back at you. That made me laugh. Uh, I mean, it is... It this is like the funny money stuff too, where the prices of the coins go back up. So this stuff starts transacting at a high values and the interesting part of that doesn't feel real. The interesting part about Bitcoin specifically is that the higher it goes, the more valid its th story becomes of an alternative store of value and alternative to the current system. And now it's not a story that I necessarily subscribe to, but you, you're going to hear the drumbeat grow louder and louder and louder if this thing really, really, really takes off. Because it's still very much a fringe asset. Very and much. It, it just won't die. If if the SBF thing didn't kill crypto, I don't know what would. No, listen, Short you don't have to love it. But if you're still calling this thing a tulip, I mean. Right. 
it, for how many times it's died and people have thrown dirt on the grave. Clearly enough people ascribe value to it. Yes, regardless of, of how silly you think it is. All right, we do, go to crypto? Uh, yeah, we're good. All right, a couple weeks ago I said, it's really hard to find a bearish signal in housing. Like It's hard to be really bearish on prices. Uh, prices could fall a couple percent again, but be really bearish, it's hard for me to see that. But I think it's really hard to be bullish too. So the Redfin had their home buyer payments that they always update. It's 40% higher than it was two years ago, three years ago. It's hard for me to think 2021 is three years ago because that's, that's what old people say. So I looked, so today the median home value they have is almost 400K at you know close to 7%, that's a $2,700 payment. If rates went to 6%, we're talking 2,400, 5% is more like 2,100. So I think you'd have to go, I think rates would have to get back to like 5% to really cause you know, a ton, a ton of movement. But last year I looked, Case Shiller rose up 5.6%. Inflation was up 3.4%. That seems low considering how much housing has moved. That's that's a big, if you're up 2% more than the inflation rate every year, that's a lot for housing. Yeah. Historically, that it was still a pretty good year. So you think if rates come down, housing prices don't go up that much? You just think activity comes back? That's my, th I think rates would have to go down quite a bit for there to be like another boom. I, I don't, I think even if rates come down to 6 or 5%, I, I think there's going to be more activity, but it's hard for me to see this a boom in housing prices again. Yeah, I, I, I think I disagree. Okay, so you think prices could go again? Like 5 10%, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, survey of the week. A recent report from Edelman Financial Engines surveyed more than 2,000 people regarding their attitudes about their wealth. Around a quarter said they feel less satisfied with the amount of money they have because of social media. And a third say they have spent more than they could afford to keep up with the Joneses. I totally buy this. Yes. I think it might Me even too. be understated. Yeah, I thought I thought that was low. I, I think this stuff is getting, the keep up with the Joneses stuff is getting Nobody worse. Nobody goes on, on social media and feels good about their situation. <laughs> That's true. Right? Yes. I mean, unless you read the replies on Twitter, then you feel okay about yourself. Like, oh, I'm not as crazy as that, that idiot. And to that point, um, Austin Reef shared a snippet that I, I'm curious to hear your take on. The title is, I think it looks like, looks like, where is this? Uh, on Reddit? I'm not sure. Um, I have a secret to share. To share. Shh. That's the, the title. After the first two to three million, a paid off home and a good car, there is no difference in quality of life between you and Jeff Bezos. Both of you have limited amount of time on earth. You have twice, if not more than Jeff. So you are richer than him. A cheeseburger is a cheeseburger, whether a billionaire eats it or you do. Money is nothing but a piece of paper on a number on your app. Real life is outdoors. Become financially independent. That's usually two to three million. Have good food. Enjoy the relations. Work out and enjoy sex. Sleep well. Call your parents. That's all there is to life. Greed has no end. Repeat after me. Time is the currency of life. Money is not. Sooner you figure this out, happier you'll be. Agree or disagree? I agree 60% of this. The other 40%. Here's, I think, the biggest thing billionaires have over everyone else. Private flights. That's that's the game, a, that's the game changer. If you have a private jet, yeah. you know how much easier your life is? Yeah. I have a flight coming up this month. I have two layovers. Yeah. You think Jeff Bezos is having two layovers? Yeah. Uh-uh. So I completely agree with you, agreeing with 60% of this. I think that there is definitely wisdom in the fact that, yes, a cheeseburger is a cheeseburger. Um, most of the time, forget about Jeff Bezos, but like most of the time people are just living their life, right? Whether you have... 2 million or 50 million, you're most of the time doing the same thing. Um, and right. I understand- but Yeah, I, if you have $7 million versus 10 million, is your life really better no, at no, 10? No. No. And I love I love the premise of this that like, let's focus, like money is just, for the most part, it's just numbers in a bank account and most of the time you're living your life. Uh, so I love the premise and I think people lose sight of this. However, there is a big difference between $2, $2 million and Jeff Bezos. Yes. <laughs> If you're a billionaire, there, uh, we, there's probably stuff that be, that makes your life easier that we don't even know about. There's other stuff that makes it way, way harder. The pressure and the- I guess the, but, the, the, the part that I agree with, 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 which he didn't say, I, one, I believe this with every fiber of my being that billionaires aren't any happier than somebody with $2 million. That I agree with. And yeah. I think a lot of them are more miserable. Yeah, I mean, at that point, the money owns you. Like you can't yes. have that much money without it just being a massive burden. So yeah, uh, I thought it was- uh, all right, before we get into the recommendations, uh, I want to talk about being the middle-aged guy at the gym. Mm. Middle-aged guy. So I've got the young Gen Zers here, and I've got the old people. So the old people, I, I walked in last week, 
And there was an old guy who literally went to the urinal and pulled his pants down to his ankles like a four-year-old. And they walk around with their stuff hanging out, towel over the shoulder, don't care. You yeah. know, you get to 70-something and you just don't care. And then they stand right next to you. I, I don't know. But then the young guys, they literally stand in the mirror of the bathroom and, like, pose. Like, triceps, you know, like. That is I'm weird. Here, right? In front of other, like, I can sneak a peek. They're like, oh, yeah, my shoulders looking pretty good lately. But, like, they're posing. And it's not like it happens occasionally. It happens all the time. So maybe this is self-serving. And, uh, but I think the middle age, call it late 30s to early 40s, is the only sane generation left. That's a good take. How's that? Yeah, is yeah. that fair? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the no offense to our not boomer to, not listeners. Not to shame everybody who's not 30 uh, or 40, but. Yes. The, the Gen Zers, they got totally ruined by growing up with the internet and social media. No offense to the boomers, but they had no chance against Facebook. Let's be honest. In the forward slash forward RE forward emails. Like, they had, they had no chance. They didn't yeah. grow up with this stuff. We, no life before. We were young enough to, like, handle the technology. But we've seen both sides. And I'm saying... People in middle age right now are the, the only sane generation, but we are going to be insane someday because there's other stuff that's come along that's going to make us insane. But right now, this is the only sane generation. Yeah, that's a good take. Okay. Recommendations. I told you Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I think, is the best new show of the year so far. I finished it. The thing I liked about it is it was a, speaking of the generation stuff, it was a millennial take on spies. Like, they overthought everything. They talked too much. There probably could have been a little more spy stuff. It got a little weird for a couple episodes, because I think that's what Donald Glover does, but I thought they landed the plane, and I really liked it, and I'd like to see a season two with two, with a new John and Jane Smith. New spies. I I can't believe how good it is. I watched... Uh, really good, right? Yeah, I, the, the quality is way higher. Every uh, episode has like one or two really good guest cameos? stars. Yeah, her cameos, yeah. Great cameos. I uh, I watched it. I took, a, uh, I took a car into the city, and I left my... AirPods in the backseat again. I just need, I just need, uh, I just need like an AirPod subscription. It's unbelievable. <laughs> you need to just go back to Wired. Uh, yeah, Mr. and Ms. Smith, good call by you. Do you think Truth Serum is real? Google gave me a conflicting answer. So, so there's, there's a Truth Serum episode and then it comes back towards the end because all these people, like, can you picture people in LA? They microdose mushrooms and they microdose little weed gummies. Can you picture them being like, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to Joshua Tree to microdose truth serum and tell each other how much all the stuff we hate about each other. Oh, interesting. Wait, I don't know. I don't I don't know if I assume truth serum. Wouldn't is that be real? fun? Like, we're gonna lock ourselves in a room and I'll take truth serum and talk shit about each other for an hour. Listen, uh, this might be embarrassing. I don't know. Is, is truth serum real? I kind of assumed it was. I looked on Google and like one of them said, yes, it's definitely real. And the other one said, no, 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 there's no way it's real. Uh, huh. So I don't know. Uh Shogun. I mean, alcohol, alcohol is kind of like truth serum. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Shogun, two episodes in. I'm all in. Very good. Feel, feel like it could have been an HBO, Apple show. It's on Hulu. It's good. I, I can see it getting even better. So it's uh, it's Succession slash Game of Thrones. More Game of Thrones. Not success. It's Game of Thrones in Japan in the whatever year it takes place. 1500s? 1400s, yeah. I also watched a re rewatch on Hulu. I'd seen it once when it first came out. Watched it again. Enough said. It's Gandolfini's last movie. It's him and Julia Louise Dreyfus. Uh, Never heard of it. It's a rom com. It was Gandolfini's last movie. Wait, and is it's, he it's, is he the is he in the rom? Yeah, it's kind huh. of this cute like they're both divorced, single divorcees, and he plays like kind of a teddy bear kind of guy, and it's not what you'd think of him at all. But it's it's like a cute rom com. Okay, interesting. I thought I, I liked it. It was even better on the rewatch, I thought. So as I mentioned, I watched Napoleon on my Vision Pro, rest in peace. Um, I had a good time watching it, even though the movie wasn't very good. Did you watch okay. it? I did not watch it yet. Okay. I wanted to watch it when it first came out, but I've heard not great things. So it, I don't know if I'm going to. It's not good, but it, that doesn't mean that it's not a mildly entertaining, fun watch. I mean, there's parts of it that are great. Okay. There's parts of it that okay. are excellent, but it felt very hollow. And I think because it was like a four hour cut that was trimmed down. So it just felt very empty. I don't really know what happened. I'm not sure like how Napoleon did what he did. And it wasn't great. Okay. That's okay. Ridley Scott's 86 years old. He tried. Really? I didn't realize he was that old. Yeah. Okay. He tried. Out of time. Um, Summing right. up this show, you and I are probably thinking it's time for a healthy correction, which means it I've probably won't happen. I've been thinking that. It's, it's enough already. Like, Yeah. We, sh we shouldn't just be levitating higher for seemingly 
little reason at all. NVIDIA gained $124 billion in market cap yesterday. I'll repeat, $124 billion. It was like $200 billion in market cap at the bottom in 2021. Or 2022, fall of 2022. So I think we all just need a little punch in the face. Just a little. Not a knockout punch, but Sounds just good. a reminder. Keep those emails coming. We've got some good ones lately. Uh, I love it when people share with us their, not doing answer a question, they share with us like their early retirement strategy. Some dude the other day said, my wife lives in Europe. Instead of spending a couple million dollars on a house here, we're going to buy like three apartments in Europe. And I loved that strategy. Mm. Anyway, keep them coming. What's our email again? Animal spirits at the compound news.com. We'll see you next time. <laughs>